Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to be talking with astrologers Lisa Scheim and Austin Kopic about the upcoming astrological forecast for November of 2021. So hey, guys, thank you both for joining me today. Hey, Chris. No problem. All right, so I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of the month ahead really quick at the very top of the video, and then once I do that, we'll sort of introduce you both a little bit more in more detail, and then we'll go into a deep dive into each of the next four weeks of November. How does that sound to you? Sounds good. It'll work. All right, here we go. Here's the planetary alignments for November. We begin the month with a new moon in the sign of Scorpio on the 4th of November. Immediately after that, Mercury ingresses into the sign of Scorpio, and Venus ingresses into Capricorn on November 5th. The following week, we have one of our main configurations of this month, which is that transiting Mars in Scorpio squares transiting Saturn in Aquarius on the 10th of November in one of our more, most kind of difficult aspects of the month and potentially of the year. Then the following week, transiting Mars opposes Uranus, continuing some of the tension of those transits from the previous week. And then immediately after that, we have a sort of culmination of events when there is a lunar eclipse in the sign of Taurus on the 19th of November. After that, things settle down a little bit, although we'll talk about the asterisks next to that statement later, when the Sun ingresses into Sagittarius on the 21st, Mercury into Sagittarius on the 24th, and then finally there's a Sun-Mercury conjunction on the 28th of November. So that is the very broad overview. Um, we are heading into eclipse season with the beginning of the eclipses in the Taurus-Scorpio axis at the end of November. And here is the round planetary movements calendar that shows you where the planets begin at the start of the month and how far through the signs of the zodiac they get by the end of the month. So that is the basic overview of November. Uh, welcome, guys. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome, Austin, and welcome, Lisa. Lisa is joining us from Ohio as our first time co hosting the podcast, even though you've appeared on many other episodes in the past. So thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so I couldn't believe I felt like you had hosted a forecast episode before, and I was almost kind of shocked to hear that you hadn't, but you've yeah. appeared briefly to do the auspicious elections for each month, mm -hmm. but this is actually your first full forecast. First yeah, full forecast, yeah. Yeah, I remember, didn't you sit in for a little bit when we did them in Denver altogether? Oh, I did pop in, I think, to do the in-person um, election description, yeah. Yeah. So, but that was a brief appearance. So, you're going to mm -hmm. join us today for the full forecast. And you, um, you and I just got done working on our yearly 2022 electional report, which we just released today. And so, we actually looked a lot at the astrology of next year and a little bit at the astrology of of November because we have an electional chart for November that we'll introduce later. But it's at the very end of the month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as we'll talk about in a bit, November kind of leads into a lot of themes that continue into the next year. Right, for sure. Um, and Austin, how are you doing? How is our cat friend Sumo Kopic, who's one of our producers on our producers tier, how is the cat doing? Um, large and in charge comes to mind. Um, you know, she's about a year and a half now. And I think two weight classes above are not petite adult cat. Okay, that is gigantic. Hopefully, Stephen, our editor, can uh, splice in some pictures or some B-roll of Sumo in the final version of this for the video viewers just to get a, a picture of how gigantic this cat is at this point. But some listeners have asked, so I wanted to yeah. wanted to inquire. Well, and her, uh, her, her winter coat has come in, and so she looks twice as massive. She's a cat squatch. Nice. <laughs> All right, good times. Well, um, let's start by doing some review of what's happened in terms of world events since our last forecast episode a month ago, because there's actually been some really interesting astrology and sort of fulfillment of some some statements and some predictions that we made in the last forecast episode. So we'll do a little bit of review at the beginning of this, and then we'll jump into looking at the astrology of November. So um, for this first segment, I wanted to start by first doing a little segment called How About That Mercury Square Pluto? <laughs> Mercury retrograde because that was pretty wild and there's some pretty literal um, things that manifested during the course of that, right? I mean, one of the things we talked about um, in the last forecast with Kelly was Mercury square Pluto and like getting to the bottom of things or like investigations and things like that. 
And one of the things that happened right around the time of Mercury's station was the release of the Pandora Papers, which was like this big, huge expose of um, you know like billionaires having money in offshore accounts in order to avoid taxes and stuff like that. And it was supposed to be one of the largest investigations by a consortium of different um, like newspapers and, and journalists uh, that had ever happened before, which is pretty striking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and it was um, you know we we were we were trying to articulate what the that Mercury station would would mean with it being both square Pluto and trying uh, Jupiter at the same time. Right, we're like, oh, there's, you know, it's it's something, uh, you know, facts from the from from the hidden deeps with the Pluto, and then with the trying to Jupiter, like, but for a good reason, or you know, towards truth, or you know, some there's something buoyant about um, Jupiter, and that like that expo, the the that leak and all that information, I think fit that absolutely perfectly. Totally. And that's a great keyword, truth. Like I keep seeing that as a recurring theme this year over and over again about how much Jupiter, that's been one of its main significations for like 2,000 years now. I mean, if you go back and look at Vedius Valens in the second century, he says truth is one of the basic significations of Jupiter. But to see that um, come out so explicitly is really striking to have like an investigative report that uncovers the truth about something. And there's actually been a more recent manifestation of that in the news that's coming up next year. I think that you noticed, right, Lisa, with the, the Jupiter-Neptune conjunction that's happening in Pisces in like the first quarter of next year. Oh, yeah. So it goes exact in April, even though that's transiting from Jan- well, actually the end of this year through May 10th of next year. But um, I guess Trump just announced a few days ago that he's trying to launch a new social media network um, called Truth. And of course, there's the Jupiter Neptune conjunction happening next spring. And, you know, illusions of truth that can be with the Neptune and Jupiter, although it can be other things. And I just find it really striking because Trump himself has Jupiter and Neptune together in Libra in the third house, with Jupiter ruling the fifth house um, of entertainment, basically. But also, they're both stationary in his chart. So it's just like a really exclamatory Jupiter Neptune. So, you know, the recurrence would be more important for him next year. Right, so it's a recurrence of the same thing, but it's just interesting the combination of Jupiter and Neptune, and uh, yeah, the truthiness of Jupiter, and yeah, we'll see how that goes. So, um, Chris, one thing before we move on, um, just back to the the Mercury retrograde um, in in tra- stationing in trying to that Jupiter. So, Jupiter has um, yeah, truth as a long time signification. The Jupiter is also just sitting on the fixed star Deneb el Gedi, which is about lawfulness and decency, mm. right? And more more moral lawful rather than simply not illegal. What was interesting about the Pandora Papers is much of what it exposed is totally legal, yet um, clearly unethical and unfair. And for those of you who've studied or worked with Deneb el Gedi, Deneb el Gedi is like like if uh, it's pro legality but it's really more pro decency um and it's like yeah this is legal but this isn't decent right that's not fair right and so we have like you know and and i would say jupiter is in alignment with what's actually right versus what is simply not technically illegal right there's a difference between the two mhm Mm-hmm. Yeah, using the what, it's sort of like companies or, or people that are su- super wealthy using the laws or loopholes in the laws that are available in order to skirt sort of paying taxes. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Like legal but not decent. Right. 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 Yeah. There's um there were another uh, number of other ones around the Mercury Pluto square that came out. Um, there's one I just read that was like, um. The oil and gas company BP paid an ex M16 firm to spy on climate activists, which on the one hand is not shocking because these things happen, right? Um, but it also just came out um, just this past week, which meant it came out during the Mercury station and was probably being investigated during the whole Mercury retrograde square Pluto. It's very Plutonian. Yeah. What, what is an M16 organization? A uh, spy, a British spy organization. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought yeah. that was M- MI6. It doesn't matter. 
Oh, yeah, maybe I maybe I miss. Or maybe they just all are it. armed with M16. Maybe, M16. Maybe Does that make M16. sense? Um, uh, yeah. So other things, there was a listener that wrote in um, at one point last month, uh, Beth Bashmore, and she said that there was a, a documentary about the cave divers um, where they did they rescued that group like a few years back in, in I think it was in the Philippines and um, yeah there there was like a whole documentary that was released around the time of the Mercury Station Square Pluto uh, about that and about the rescue of that group with the help of cave divers which is a surprisingly literal manifestation because I think that was one of the metaphors that we were. Using, but we we're using it as a metaphor, not as like a literal cave. Yeah, we divers. talked about tunnels mm-hmm. and caverns for like fifteen minutes, mm-hmm, right? On sure. that last forecast. So I love it when that stuff happens, and it brings up a thing. Um, Ch- Chenny Nicholas wrote on Twitter the other day where she was like, "Whatever the most literal or obvious manifestation of something is, that's often what happens with the astrology. Sometimes it's, you know, it can be subtle." But sometimes it's just completely lacking in subtlety and is just the most literal thing you can think of. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I love literal astrology. Uh, it's really funny. Well, let's hope November is more metaphoric. Right, that's true. <laughs> right. <laughs> On the other hand, um, looking back at October, you know, there was no real separating the Mercury retrograde in Libra from the Sun Mars conjunction in Libra. And um, you know the the two literally conjoined the sun at almost exactly the same time, and there's a, a real entanglement of the significations. Um, and I believe part of the way that we discussed that last month um, was um, simmering, right? Like pots on the stove, like they're not quite ready to boil over, but you can see what is likely to boil over in this next cycle. And so, in terms of simmering, right? Um, we have. In the United States, like <clears throat> in a sense, a beginning of I don't know uh, the the beginning of a new labor movement would be a dramatic way to put it, but like big strikes either happening or getting ready to happen um, across a wide variety of industries. Um, there were lots of protests all over Western Europe. Like you can you can see what's on the stove and getting heat, right. There's major tensions between um, the sort of rebelliousness of, of Uranus and whatever the establishment is uh, of Saturn, and that's only going to intensify as we basically head into the third and final exact square between Saturn and Uranus that's coming in December. But we are definitely ramping up to that at this point. Here's the image I've been using all year since our year ahead forecast from Archetypal Explorer of those three exact hits of Saturn square Uranus and how we are on the upward slope heading into the next one right now. Yeah, and you look at how steep that acceleration from where we are to the exact uh, hit at the end of December, right? Saturn is now direct very recently and Uranus is very retrograde. And so now we have a mutual application. Instead of one chasing the other, they're both moving towards their, uh, you know, their, uh, <laughs> uh, their faded, uh, their faded interaction, right? So there's, you know, both the, uh, uh, the disruptive Uranus and the uh, uh, attempting to bring order Saturn are moving towards each other, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah, and that's about to get accelerated um, in just a few days here as soon as Mars ingresses into the sign of Scorpio on the 30th of October and then just starts speeding up and pouring sort of gasoline on that fire, which then will sort of culminate in the November and December timeframe. Mm-hmm. For sure. So we're getting a little ahead of ourselves though. So um, to back up just a little bit, some of the other review stuff, uh, we had. Saturn and Uranus, or sorry, Saturn and Jupiter both station in Aquarius. And one of the things that I'd been saying for a few months about the return of Jupiter to Aquarius is that there was going to be some revisiting of things that began last December when Jupiter first went into Aquarius and conjoined Saturn. And one of the things that I noticed and was like looking for because there was such a notable coinciding of events last December was. December, of course, is when they first rolled out the um, vaccines in the US and started administering them to the public. And so Jupiter left for a few months over the summer when it dipped into Pisces. And that's when some of the mask mandates suddenly were lifted and it seemed like things were going back to normal. But then Jupiter 
stationed retrograde in Pisces early in the summer and retrograded out and went back into Aquarius, which seemed to imply that there would be some revisiting of things um, as Jupiter returned to Aquarius that needed to be returned to uh, to either review them or in order to redouble those efforts from way back in December when Saturn and Jupiter conjoined. So it seemed like two of the things that I noticed was one, um, booster shots. There's this huge discussion about booster shots over the past month, and a lot of people I know, a number of older people that actually started getting their booster shots because it was six months out since their second one. And I think that was eventually um, approved, or, or some public agency started actually saying it was okay to get booster shots. Do you remember what that was, Lisa? I don't know when the um, the actual okay was. I know that just a few days ago, as Jupiter was going direct, a few days after its direct station, um, they they extended the approval of booster shots to more people, so greater eligibility, basically. And also, um, the FDA, uh, Pfizer just asked the FDA for approval on the same day, on the 21st, for uh, children from ages 5 to 11 with like a reduced um, dosage shot. Okay. So it's being expanded to other age ranges. Yeah, and in terms of just like revisitation of the project, I know that there was a report that came out. The FDA is um, uh, very critical of some of the Johnson and Johnson data. I don't know the ins and outs of it, but they were like, mm, "We're not sure about all of this that you fed us. We need to revisit it." Mm, okay. And so, yeah, so those were two things that were really interesting in terms of a return to that was just it seemed like a expansion of the vaccine efforts, which is, is an interesting echo of the start of that back in December when they first started the project. So I guess that's part of what Jupiter and Aquarius was about, which we'll see then what happens when Jupiter goes into Pisces and if that's not more hopeful or a little bit more hopeful during the first half of next year for um, returning to more no normalcy, which is what it almost seemed like we were headed towards last summer when Jupiter first dipped into Pisces, but we'll, we'll talk about that more later. Um, all right. Are there any other review things that we want to touch on that are like major things? I know we wrote down a bunch, but maybe we don't have to cover all of them unless there's really important ones that we wanted to make sure we mentioned. Um, I just wanted to mention some of the Mercury Pluto things again. Um, the Eastman, the John Eastman memo came out um, September 21st, actually, was interesting in that um, that was the Mercury Pluto first square. And uh, it was called Peril was the book that it came out in, and then all the newspapers picked it up. And so basically the Eastman memo was um, part of the legal attempt of, at a strategy to overturn the election, the last pre presidential election. And so, of course, that's very Mercury-Pluto. Um, but I also found it striking that, you know, it was leading into um, the Mars-Saturn. Um, it was applying within about three degrees when all of that was happening before the January 6th insurrection. And so this was part of the Mars-Saturn that we're going to be talking about again, those kind of dynamics of, um, you know, um, different forces trying to battle each other, basically, and insurrection type of energies versus like establishment type of energies. Yeah, that's something that we're going to be talking about a lot as we talk about the Mars-Saturn alignments for November that really ramp up and heat up this month. So why don't we go ahead and jump right into that then, since it seems like we're we're eager to get into that astrology and we're already sort of moving in that direction. Um, all right, so let me put the chart up just to show you what the chart looks like at the very start of the month. Here it is for today as we're recording this episode, and here is the chart set for November 1st. So um, the main thing that happens it's already happened technically by the time we start November, but it, it happens just a few days before we begin at the very end of October. On October 30th, we have Mars departing from Libra and ingressing into the sign of Scorpio on October 30th, where it's going to be for the entirety of the month. And as soon as it makes that transition into Scorpio, it begins the sort of culmination of one of the last really major tense aspects of the year that we talked about and really focused on in the year ahead forecast, which is the beginning of the Mars-Saturn square, which will go exact when Mars hits seven degrees of Scorpio around November 10th, and then the Mars-Uranus opposition 
uh, which will go exact when Mars reaches 12 degrees of Scorpio around November 17th. So that's really the main aspect I think we're going to be talking about and focusing on during this episode because that's the most tense aspect and it's the most standout alignment I think that happens all month. Mm -hmm. So what are, what are we feeling about that or what are your initial feelings about Mars um, squaring Saturn and opposing Uranus? Well, I think that the I don't know the most useful way to think about it is just to to first start with the fact that it's um, what we're doing is we're bringing you know heating, inflammatory, dangerous, fierce Mars energy to bear on a problem that we've had all year, right? Like Saturn Uranus is the is just there and has been causing <laughs> uh, has yeah has been authoring a variety of tensions that really describe the period of time that we're in, and so we we in a sense we know what um, Saturn Uranus is. And maybe we should take a second to remind everybody. But what we're doing is we're adding something to what's already there, right? The Saturn Uranus, as um, Lisa, I think you just mentioned, it's that um, you know the Uranus has this rebellious, disruptive, anything but continuing on the way we are energy. Whereas Saturn is the order maker, right? And so one of the ways that I've been thinking about this with both. Um, um, Mars in a superior square to Saturn, um, angry at Saturn, and then uh, Uranus on the <clears throat> the other square, um, undermining Saturn, right fourth house relative to Saturn, uh, with the these disruptions and rebellions, is it really shows? Um, how should we say? It really shows the difficult task of trying to make an order that works at this point in time. And I think that's very clear collectively, right? Because there there's the, you know, there there the how should we say there's the the pandemic, right, which was an event, but then there's all of this human response to it, right? And when there's a disruptive thing, we're like, okay, how do we how do we make things work? How do we make order, right? And then there are also a variety <laughs> um in a lot of countries, especially the US, there are um, there are a lot of problems with the order being that's been created in the U.S. for the last 40 years. Um, that order doesn't work for a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> and so you see with both Uranus and Mars poking at Saturn, um, you, uh, you're going to see a boiling over of frustration and anger with, uh, we could say, inadequate attempts to make order or inadequate attempts to make the order that works for people and that they desire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the different orders that different people want and are expecting or are feeling let down by, you know, those can look differently for different segments of people. It, yeah. And they certainly do. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, it, but it's like, what do people agree on? This ain't great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's like one of the things, though, with the energy is because it's setting up this um, dichotomy between Saturn, which is like the establishment, and Uranus, which is the rebellious tendency. Um, it's just making it so whatever the established um, authority is in a given context, like that's what people are rebelling against, and they're rebelling against the attempt of the establishment to impose order on the non-establishment or, or whatever the establishment is ruling over. So the ordered, the ordered, yeah, that's a mm -hmm. good one. The, the ordered versus the order, er. Orderless. Um, yeah. So those tensions have been there, and it's it's come off and on all year. Like we saw a um, major version of that earlier this year that was accelerated. Like we already had an instance of that the day that Mars ingressed into Taurus um, in January, which was January 6th. And that was um, the Saturn Uranus square. And then it was Mars like ingressing into that and then just throwing flames onto the fire. And that was the um, insurrection on January 6th and this sort of uh, whatever it was, the raiding of the capital that that occurred, and the almost like a sort of attempt, a coup attempt on the U.S. government. So, what was interesting, and that I keep thinking about about that, is that Mars was in the inferior position at the time, at zero degrees of Taurus. So, Saturn, being earlier in the order of signs, actually had the upper hand over Mars and got the upper hand over Mars. But part of the thing that's weird about this month is. It's finally reversed. So we went through 
the square uh, that square I was just talking about. We went through the opposition of Mars and Saturn over the summer. I think that went exact what in like July or late June, and now we're at Mars and Scorpio, where suddenly Mars has the upper hand and is in the superior position astrologically over Saturn. Um, so Mars and, being and is in, in a sign where it has a lot more power. Right, right. Mar- Mars is a, is somewhat defanged in Taurus, um, but Mars is you know um, clawed, armored, and stingered in Scorpio. Yeah, it's true. I mean, although it's interesting that that day, January sixth, actually started with Mars and Aries at the very, very end of Aries, and so that that was the sort of impetus to it all. But I, I can imagine it moving into Taurus, where it didn't have good dignity, being sort of like a damper on how you know how well it went, um, but certainly. In Scorpio, it's not just you know in good dignity, just like it is in Aries, but it's more strategic than Aries for sure. Right. So, so one of the questions is just what does it look like when when Mars, the one that's doing the inflaming or the sort of rebelling in some sense against the establishment or doing the uh, attacking even in some sense, suddenly gets the upper hand over Saturn. Uh, and exacerbates those energies, but also is able to use them to its own benefit in some ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so th- this will obviously play out in a variety of ways. But I think a good example of that is um, some of the large-scale um, labor strikes, which are either about to take place or, ha- or ongoing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> you know, the um, there are a lot of industries that just can't run when people are striking. It's not. Um, you know, um, it's not a bunch of people like cosplaying rebellion. Um, like there, there's real power um, in the larger unions, right? If we're looking at martial feelings, like no, we're pissed that we've been working ten hour days with one day off a month, right? That there's a, how should we say? There is a fixity to that anger, which is very well described by Mars and Scorpio, and part of another interesting part of this Mars and Scorpio activating Saturn Uranus is that <clears throat> Mars uh, having very recently uh, made its once every two year conjunctions um, with the sun was it's invisible while it's doing that. And so Mars is literally going to come into visibility for the first time in this new two year cycle, right in the middle of these, the, the square right in the middle of the configuration to Saturn Uranus. Mm. Nice, right? When when it gets like fifteen degrees away from the sun, yeah. Like uh, here's what people are angry about, right? Like being revealed. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. You know, with regard to the strikes, a lot of the things actually this past month were authorizations to strike. There are people on strike in some of the companies, but there's like a whole bunch more that authorized a strike actually right around that weekend um, uh, that Saturn was stationing. I think it was October 9th, tenth, and so. A bunch of those authorize them, but like haven't done it yet, and so I can easily imagine that happening in November. Yeah, I, I, we were talking about this uh, earlier. Uh, I have a hard time imagining that November is going to cool off any of these things, right? If um, back to the the kitchen and the stovetop, if there whatever there's been heat on is likely um, <laughs> it, it is not going to simmer down, but is going to flame on. Yeah, and one of the Mercury retrograde ones actually is was, there was like a film actors or guild strike that was about to happen at the beginning of the retrograde, but then I think over that three week period, by the end when Mercury stationed direct, it was called off, or they reached some sort of agreement. Yeah, um, they they tentatively reached an agreement, but they haven't ratified it. What that means is the union leadership accepted it, but the rest of the workers have not yet. And so, and, and actually, I was reading that a lot of the workers were actually really pissed at the leadership for saying for accepting the deal. And so they they can still not ratify it, and then there would be a strike. And I imagine some of that's going to happen in November, probably. Yeah, and that disagreement within leadership versus membership of unions is not confined solely to that union. That's another, and that's that's an interesting sort of. Um, uh, one whole, one fractal level down of the Saturn Uranus and the ordered versus the ordering, right? Even within an organization. Exactly, exactly. So was, there was the strike dynamic and the Saturn Uranus dynamic between like the companies and the workers or the unions, and then there's the union leadership versus the union workers themselves. Yeah. So a lot of them are like, I don't think we're gonna ratify this. 
I haven't seen a date yet. I was looking for a date. But. Right. And, and so if we're looking for what kinds of, what kinds of things the Uranus and Taurus has been doing, right? Especially square to Saturn, right? We talked about the like demonstration, um, you know, rebellion saying this order doesn't work for us, but then there's also, you know, we've seen really consistently the, uh, the supply chain issues, um, currency valuations bouncing up and down. Uh, the whole crypto story is in a sense, a Uranus and Taurus story. Um, and you know, you think about, Oh, workers striking and could that possibly play into supply chain issues? Mm, yeah, <laughs> right. Like absolutely. Definitely. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you, you'd said, you'd pointed out Lisa that the, that Uranus and Taurus is in the sixth of the Sibley chart, which would position it perfectly for um, describing labor. Right. Cause I was seeing that, you know, that a lot of us, unions were striking but I, I you know obviously i'm going to see that more than other countries news but um yeah it is actually the uranus transit exactly is in the sixth house of workers labor etc um in the sibley u.s chart so that just you know puts further emphasis on that issue here yeah yeah well and what's interesting is the you know this sort of like wave of uh labor activism is um, in a sense, uh, 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 um, a more acute set of events that speak to trends that have been happening. You know, people call, talking about the Great Resignation. Um, you know, there's all oh, there's 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 been a lot of talk and a lot of feelings about what it's like to work in the United States, right? And people rethinking that, which is a Uranus thing, right? Uranus, <clears throat> um, part of rebellion against a given order is also rebellion against an, a, a, a past order of thinking about things. Be like, well, this is the way, this is the way I think about having a job, mm -hmm. right? And the, <clears throat> the sort of um, the forced um, pause uh, in labor that a lot of people experienced triggered um, or catalyzed, is a better word, catalyzed a like, maybe I've been thinking about this whole thing wrong, or maybe I'm going to rethink my whole paradigm about what it means to work, what it means, um, what it means to labor, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the, the strikes are like the obvious part of that. Right. Well, and I know that you'd mentioned recently that happening within the con larger context of Pluto and Capricorn, which I've absolutely been thinking about as well. Um, because during this pandemic, um, the, you know, the, the biggest earners, um, actually got much richer and most people did the opposite. And so that's just a furthering of the Pluto and Capricorn trend. And I had wondered because Pluto is already so late in Capricorn by degree. It's like, when is the other side going to happen? Mm. Um, you know, we're almost at 26 um, this year, it's like 26, 27 in the spring. So, um, you know, but this has also happened after other pandemics in the past um, that workers get more rights because there are fewer workers, basically. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the big stories about the Black Plague. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so you could think of that as part of the Pluto and Capricorn transit ongoingly. You could also think of that as the Saturn-Uranus square. You know, Saturn, literally the reduction of, of laborers, and therefore they can rise up because they have, you know, more power. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, it, it makes me think of just the fact that they're both in Earth signs. And that, you know, they're both re referring to material conditions with the Pluto and Capricorn speaking to sort of the pyramidal structure of things and what it's like at each floor of the pyramid um, and how the, um, you know, the, the nice things have uh, keep getting, uh, keep getting uh, rides on the elevator to the top floor and that, you know, um, it's hard to find a place where that's not true to some degree, but it's been um, pushing further and further and further in that direction for, I don't know, 30 or 40 years in the United States. And it's, it's gotten to, you know, it's gotten to a point. And then that intersecting with the whole sign trine with Uranus, right? Also in an earth sign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Earth signs, one of the other ones that you mentioned that's relevant potentially for some of the transits that start this month, especially the Mars ingress into Scorpio, is um, Biden's chart and how that's hitting some of Biden's chart and, and activating it in not super great ways because that ingress of Mars into Scorpio goes into his 12th house and into his Scorpio stellium where he 
will be having a Mars return. Um, and as soon as it ingresses, it opposes his moon uh, down there in Taurus in the sixth house. So we were talking about this a little bit in the pre-show chat, just the extent to which sometimes the leader of a country's chart ends up reflecting some of the things that are happening in the country at the time, or that their transits become transits for the con- country in some sense, um, mm-hmm. which again is just sort of reiterating some of the tensions that are really probably going to come to a head over the next month or two as we get that Mars transit through Scorpio. Right, and as far as you know, uh, as far as sort of things in October setting us up perfectly for November, um, and with Biden's chart being so heavily invested in the fixed and so much pressure about to be exerted on the fixed, like the the approval for the Biden administration is like half of what it was six months ago. Right, it's obviously um, not heading into a great time for the administration. Mm, yeah, so it's a really crucial period. Um, he, of course, is going to have a birthday, and I think we we're calculating this. And he's moving from his seventh house perfection year to his eighth house perfection year. So that that moon is going to be more activated, as well as his Jupiter placement. And the Jupiter placement's actually pretty good, but it also activates the eighth house, which can be some challenges. Um, I know one of the things that was interesting is during the Mercury retrograde, is there was all those talks about a government shutdown. Um, but eventually that got forestalled, and I think they kicked the can to like December, right? I think so. Yeah. So that's great with that um, Saturn, <laughs> that Saturn Uranus square going exact uh, later in December around that time. So we'll see how that goes. Mm, right. Yeah. And it's interesting that Biden has the same rising sign as the U.S. Sibley chart, and so it just really reiterates, you know, the theme of. Yes, a leader's chart often does reflect something about the conditions in the country at the time, but this is just like doubled up because it's the exact same houses. Mm, that's a great point. And then there's also, in terms of like bigger charts with bigger implications that are activated by this, the chart of the European Union um, gets nailed by all this uh, fixed stuff. Right. The EU has, what, like five planets fixed, something like that? Okay. Um, all right. Why don't we get into our weekly breakdown? Um, so here is the weekly astrology alignments that were designed for us by Zartana again this month. And we start out the month of November with a Mercury Pluto square, which goes exact on November 2nd. So we're coming out of the retrograde and we get one more square before Mercury eventually goes into Scorpio. Then we get our first lunation of the month, which is a new moon in Scorpio on November 4th. So maybe we should talk a little bit about that lunation and take a look at the chart for the lunation um, at this point. Sure. Let me pull that up. Yeah, this new moon is actually, even if you don't normally put a lot of emphasis on the particulars of the lunation chart. Um, This one is actually kind of crazy and leads us into the rest of November, what most of the rest of the November feels like, because it's a new moon exactly opposite Uranus, in Scorpio opposite Uranus. (laughs) Right. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Look at it, 12, it goes exact at 1240 Scorpio on November 4th, opposite very closely within seven minutes of Uranus at 1247 Taurus. So we have a rebelliousness, um, some unexpected element to this new moon, but at the same time it's square to Saturn, so there's some tensions of things, something trying to hold it back or keep it in check, keep it under something's thumb, um, or or cool it down in some sense. Just keep it under control. Yeah, the attempts to keep it under control and the tension between you know, the closer aspect is to Uranus, so it's almost like in some ways the rebelliousness is um, the more intense of the feelings. And mm-hmm. then at the same time, Mars has just ingressed into Scorpio. So it's building up to that and it's moving into it and bringing some speed and some quickness and some urgency to some of those impulses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Mars is ruling both of the luminaries and it's square Saturn by about four degrees. So um, there's a lot of frustration in this chart for sure. Yeah. There's, you know, with Mars Saturn just by itself, you get this sort of deadly serious 
um, quality where it's like, okay, we've, you know, this has to get done and we've only got so much time. It's super important. And then, you know, which, uh, how should I say it can be stressful, um, but can be productive. Um, and what makes this difficult is we have Uranus then like throwing, you know, throwing monkey wrenches, right. Throwing <laughs> like mm. random, um, or seemingly random disruptions into what's already like a very tense, focused, um, no room for error feeling process. Right. Because we, we were trying to come up with some good keywords for Mars square Saturn. And one of them was like that which requires sustained effort and having to like put in work and exert yourself over an extended period of time. So it's like something that would normally be a sprint, but having to do it over a long, several week period, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a test of endurance basically, but like that frustrating edge where you want to go faster, but it's just not going to go you know, faster than it has to go, which is the Saturn. Right, but you can't go too slow either. Right, right? exactly. It's not just a purely Saturnian thing where it's like, well, I have to walk 400 miles, but I, you know, in my time frame, it's like, no, you have to do those 400 miles, um, you know, in two weeks or your, you know, your firstborn dies. Right. And if you go too fast and sprain your ankle, well, then you've just slowed yourself down. It, it makes me think of um, uh, fight camps that boxers and other combat athletes go through, where it's like that eight weeks to try to get the person at like, uh, like peak performance, peak lethality, um, where you can't take it easy. But what often happens, you go too hard and you get knocked out in sparring and then you're, you know, walking into the fight with a concussion or a torn, you know, a, a torn ligament or, a, you know, an ankle or, you know, whatever that is. And so it's like, it, it, there's a very, I want to say like the, the golden mean, um, between Mars and Saturn is tricky. Cause you've got, you know, too fast Mars on one side and too slow Saturn on the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And they're not really trying to be compatible since they're at a hard aspect. So it's like you have to sort of provide that yourself, if at all possible. Try to meld them. Yeah, yeah. Right. So lunation-wise, um, other things happening with that lunation. I mean, it's weird because the other two inner planets are just about to change signs. So they're not fully there in the party yet, but they're about to be. So Mercury is about to change signs and go into Scorpio, where it's going to finish and complete some of those uh, aspects with Mars right at the same time as Mars is completing its aspect with Saturn. And then Venus is getting ready to ingress into Capricorn, where it will begin its long buildup to the Venus retrograde station and the conjunction with Pluto that will take up most of the winter here in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah, once um so I mean Venus moves into Capricorn the day after the new moon. And um, you know, it's gonna be Venus in Capricorn until March sixth. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And then Venus didn't close by the malefics for another month. So right now, <laughs> right before um this new moon in November is the last chance for sort of frivolity, I would say, <laughs> for a while. Yeah, they uh and you know, as we're talking about Earth signs and tangible things collectively, right? The, <clears throat> um, and the, Venus also has a special role during this period of time as the ruler of Uranus, because Uranus isn't uh, Venus's sign of Taurus, right? And so, you know, one of the things we're already, you know, we're very much primed for, um, even without November's special sauce, is the is supply chain disruptions around the, the holiday season. Mm -hmm. which, you know, where supply chains are normally overloaded, right? And so, of course, and so, you know, what's Venus? Venus is the nice things, right? So it's like, oh, it's the thing I ordered. It's the PlayStation 5 I ordered three months ago. It's the, you know, oh, they're out of stock of the thing. Oh, you know, I got my Christmas presents for my kids came on, you know, February 17th. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Right. All right. So... That is that lunation, that first lunation for the month of November. And then, as we said, everything starts changing signs, and we get the last, basically immediately after that lunation, the following day, the final pieces of November fall into place when Mercury goes into Scorpio and Venus moves into Capricorn. 
um, the very next day on Saturday, November 6th, Mercury uh, forms, that's not a trine, it should actually be a sextile, with Venus from early Scorpio to early Capricorn. Mm -hmm. So there's one little nice soft aspect before we get the hard aspects. Right. And immediately after that, shortly after that, we get into the second week of the month when Mercury starts hitting Mars and Saturn and, and basically making hard aspects with everything, which is going to amplify some of those difficult alignments that were already tense sort of on their own. And it just reminds me of how in many of the ancient astrological texts, they'll use Mercury as um, sort of an amplifying factor. They'll say this indicates this condition, and Mercury, if it gets involved, will just double or intensify um, whatever is already indicated in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mercury um, and Mercury taking on the nature of whatever planets it's in aspect to. Right. Mm -hmm. So they say if it's a, if it's with good planets, then Mercury will be benefic, and if it's with it, malefic planets, then it will just become malefic. So it's sort of like a chameleon in that way, but also an amplifying factor. Yeah, I think of it as the um, the mailman. Right. What is the mailman delivering? Mm -hmm. Right. Like what at your uh, the po it's like you go to the post office. It's like oh, it looks like um, you know you have a partially decomposed, decapitated head. <laughs> right. Uh, if it's, you know, Mercury is delivering the malefics, right? Or, you know, a nice uh, birthday cake or a wheel of Parmesan cheese if it's uh, Venus, <laughs> you know, right. whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is just really intense because the Mercury Mars conjunction happens just about the same time as the Mars Saturn square goes exact. And then later, um, the moon in Aquarius actually triggers all of that. So, you know how sometimes when the transiting moon, will trigger something that went exact a few days ago, and then it'll like reactivate it. But this is triggering it almost immediately. Yeah, well, what's funny is the moon's there actually at five Aquarius mm -hmm. already, and it's coming up to seven right when Mercury's hitting Mars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and just on a very simple timing level, like moon in fixed signs is extra rough this month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so what are some good for this first combination of Mercury and Mars, Mercury conjoining Mars in Scorpio on November 10th? What are some good Mercury conjunct Mars keywords? Mm, angry speech, like frustration and anger and impatient. Impatience affect the mind, affect your words, affect how you interact with other people. Yeah, sharp tongues, angry thoughts. Um, on an external level, you know, whenever Mercury is badly afflicted like this, we get um, external uh, external results that are reminiscent of what people associate with a Mercury retrograde, right? It's the Mercury thing's not working. Yeah, that's true. Right? Like Mercury, right? It could look like travel not happening or something, you know, a letter not being received, you know, the, those miscommunications, those system, system is down for a while, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. True. Yeah. Um, and sometimes also people having uh, the impulse to communicate and say the first thing that comes to your head, not necessarily being the best thing to do in that instance. And maybe mm -hmm. in some instances, getting really angry or saying something in the heat of the moment that you might later regret once you've cooled down. Definitely. Yeah. There's, a, there's an idea about not believing your thoughts all of the time in Buddhism. And this would be like a prime time period in November to, to enact that, to sort of second guess your thoughts before you say them. Of course, the impulse will be to do the opposite. Right, to act on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really one of the best pieces of, of advice that I've always found useful during Mercury Mars transits is like if you're writing an angry response or email to somebody to like put it down for a day and come back to it a day or two later and then if, see if you still feel like sending that same email, and if you do, if you still feel like wording it exactly the same way, or if getting some distance from it doesn't make you rethink uh, sort of what you originally wrote. Definitely. Yeah, and maybe it's write out the angry version and don't send, and then reread it the next day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, someone in the chat of our live audience of patrons that's joining us, Nicola Phillips mentions road rage, which is a really good keyword for Mercury Mars. 
Yeah. Um, it's you know, Mercury is is not just communication, but also short distance travel and um, Mars. I've been really enjoying like understanding how Mars speeds things up, and one of the things that it can do is like. Push people to want to go faster, and sometimes mm. driving faster, or driving more aggressively, is a pretty straightforward Mercury and Mars combination. But that can also be, you know, dangerous um, if mm -hmm. if a person does that as well. Right. Most definitely. All right. So that combination is going exact on November tenth, and then pretty soon after that. Um, Mercury squares Saturn at the same time. So it's kind of weird because it's like going from Mercury sort of stepping on the gas gas pedal, which is Mars, to suddenly like hitting a brick wall immediately after that, which is Saturn in some sense, so to speak, or encountering the limitations of a hard stop um, and, a, and a wall or a boundary that you cannot pass beyond further almost immediately afterwards, which could be like an authority figure, it could be a limitation, it could be just a hard stop in some way. Mm -hmm, right. Yeah, or, so or a boundary, um, a, a, a significant boundary crossed, which um, mm -hmm. one might regret. Because with yeah. Mars in that mm -hmm. position, like Mars is not, uh, Mars, uh, as you say, all, all of Saturn's boundaries are not going to be impassable by Mars. Right, I I think of um, sort of like that that action movie trope where the uh, the car the vehicle like blasts through the gate, mm. Mm -hmm. right? Right. Or it's making me think of like the consequences. It's something that Diana and I talked about in the Saturn episode earlier this month, which was sometimes Saturn represents the um, consequences of past actions, whether positive ones or sometimes negative ones. And I think that's why some. Like in modern astrology, some astrologers in the late 20th century started to associate Saturn with the concept of karma, uh, which I don't fully go for because I think if you're going to use the idea of karma, like everything in a chart is karmic. But there might be a, a reason for that, maybe because of the notion of um, past actions and the consequences of those coming to fruition at some point. That is a much more Saturnian type thing. Right. And this feels like quick consequences, you know, because it's all happening so. Simultaneously, almost to that day. So it's like you send the angry email, and then the person like rejects you, or the person you know says no to what you want anyway, or you know that sort of thing. Um, ideally, with everything applying to Mars and and Saturn, you moderate that yourself. But it's not a very moderate combination. So it could be the other people. And I was thinking about that a lot about this month. Is like because they're all in like squares or oppositions, all of these hard aspects. It's likely to be enacted through other people in your life, and you will probably be playing one or more of those roles to someone else at the same time. Yeah, at least like in in the moment, right? You might be like, oh, you know, and that's part of the like sort of waking up and being like, oh, I'm doing the Mars in that planetary configuration, or oh, I'm being Saturn, um, which, you know, you have to break some of that accidental identification to get a better result than is just promised by the transiting skies. Yeah. That makes me think of somebody else. If you are Saturn, then it's like somebody else is the Mars figure that crosses a boundary that's not okay for you and you having to put up and establish what your boundaries are and, to, and enforce them. Um, or alternatively, going back to the driving metaphor and a reversal of that, due to the sequence here, it's like Mercury hitting Mars is um, driving too fast and like going over the speed limit. But then when Mercury immediately runs into Saturn, you get pulled over by the cops and have to deal with the consequences of of that of going too fast. Right, but then Mercury moves right onto Uranus. Right. right? So then it's like, <laughs> Not and maybe none of this counts at all. Maybe you know, maybe this whole game is broken. Right. So, and the thing is, like, they're all going to get hit over and over, like, activated again and again in different order throughout the month. Right. Um, so here in this second week, though, we've got this sequence of Mercury hitting Mars on the 10th, then Mercury squaring Saturn and Mars squaring Saturn both on the 11th, and then eventually Mercury opposing Uranus on Saturday the 13th. Yeah, and I would say I would just point out that this uh, the perfection of the Mars Saturn, which is also the perfection of Mercury Mars, and then then Saturn, that sort of 
that sort of lays out the peak tension of the month that begins that, like the time between Mars con- uh, Mars ex- uh, exactly aspecting Saturn and then Mars exactly aspecting Uranus and then getting the eclipse. Like it's really that like middle 10 days would be a quick way to, to abbreviate it um, mm-hmm. is the most tense. Like right. it's, it, you know, it ratchets up pretty quickly. Like that new moon makes most of it pretty clear, but like peak tension is like Mars between aspects to Saturn and Uranus with Mercury there with an eclipse mm-hmm. on the way in Uranus's sign. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've actually got a, a image from archetypal explorer.com, which shows the clustering of those aspects around the middle of the month. And it really gives you a good idea if you're watching the video version of um, when some of this stuff peaks in intensity around the middle, because you just see all of the most tense aspects clustering around that that second and third week, I guess, of November. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This just looks so combustible to me, the middle. Combustible, you know, the Mars Saturn and then the Mars Uranus. It's like, it could be explosions, whether literal or metaphoric. Um, yeah. And the Mars Saturn, going from the Mars Saturn to the Mars Uranus, it makes me think of like explosions after being told no for some reason. Um, you know, that just that pent up frustration just suddenly gets released rather than, you know, confined by Saturn after it, after it uh, le- uh, goes past Saturn. So, yeah, it also looks like contrary actions to me. Like the middle of the month, I could easily see people just behaving really erratically and in a way that you might feel is irrational um, because there's just so much pent up energy and then everything hits Uranus after Saturn. And so there's like a little bit of potential control first, but then it all, all just like breaks loose. Um, so, you know, contrary action is a pretty neutrally worded Mars Uranus thing. And there can be contrary action for good reasons, like the labor strikes and things, right? Um, there can also be people just acting contrary because they feel like it. Um, and so there'll probably be a lot of both. A lot of people are going to be pretty wound up. Mm-hmm. Right. And even yep. if it's not you, if everybody around you has a lot going on, like that's the atmosphere. And, you know, stress and tension are very contagious. Yeah, definitely. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's a good month for your chamomile. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, that bomb shelter chamomile. Is <laughs> right. My, uh, my favorite strain. Special high level chamomile. I mean, what are some things like that that are good? Um, uh, sort of soothing type things one can do when you're dealing with really tense Mars Saturn aspects, really tense Mars Uranus aspects, uh, tense Mercury Saturn Uranus aspects. Like the chamomile, that's a good like idea. That idea of like sympathetic magic, or or the idea of doing something that is the opposite to ameliorate or soften something that's hard is like a long running strand in the astrological tradition. So some of that might be good good advice for this month. Yeah, magnesium baths and chamomile and lavender and all of those good calming things. I mean, you could try to do the opposite. You could also try to work out your frustration through, you know, exercise. It's a good Mars thing, but you have to be careful not to be injured because that has more of a propensity for that. Do like moderate exercise, even though that won't quite be what you feel like. Yeah, and there's also just like having a frame on it and how long does this last? You know, I find that during during periods of time that are just kind of obviously gnarly, um, how should I say, but bringing, a, bringing a military mindset to it where it's like, no, no, this part isn't fun. Like there's a job to do, there's danger around, like I'll, you know, deal with whatever else later, but like just, you know, I don't know, sort of a nose to the grindstone um, knowing how long it lasts rather than looking around and being like, oh, this is life. Well, if this is life, this fucking sucks, blah, blah, blah. Um, because that's, you know, that's not uh, most of life, but it is some periods and, you know, just kind of a little bit of like blinders on discipline, <laughs> discipline enacted, et cetera, et cetera, for a set period of time. Right. When I was looking at November ahead of time, I was just thinking like, if all you experience in November is like severe frustration and like grunt work that you don't feel like doing and like, you know, internal anger, you're actually doing well. <laughs> like that's, that's like the best case scenario, I think. Yeah. I, um, so I, as I was telling both of you earlier, um, 
Uh, I made a pact with myself to do a death march on finishing the faces edits. So that will be my Mercury, Mars, Saturn. It's just being locked in a room and unable to leave until X number of hours every day uh, are put into <laughs> finishing that. So hopefully that'll be, uh, you know, a, 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 an appropriately um, unpleasant container for some of the uh, transiting energies. Yeah, that's a tension I still have as an astrologer, even at this stage, 20 years into it, between um, sometimes you have to distinguish between there's some version of really difficult transits, which is that you need to buckle down and do something that is unpleasant but necessary and requires sustained effort or is even like super uncomfortable and that, that is that you don't enjoy like going to a dentist and and getting major work done uh, can sometimes be a really literal manifestation of a hard transit to your chart or of something that's happening in the sky versus um from a like an electional standpoint sometimes when you should actively avoid doing things that could be more likely to um, go wrong or where something could go bad if you do it right at the peak of the difficult transit like you know if you had something scheduled for November 10th this month at the peak of the Mars Saturn square and there's often an ambiguity between whether you should um, really avoid certain dates or whether you should really lean in into them when they actually match the energy of what you're doing yeah absolutely um, and so you know part of my choice was, uh, took that into account. Part of it is that the Mars and Scorpio is in a relatively uh, useful place. It's a transit through the fifth as the ruler of the fifth for me, right? So there's like literally a capacity like that. There's a strong suggestion there. They're like, oh, you you can use this in a useful way. And I didn't commit to this. I'm not. I, I or I'm not committing to this particular death march. Um, in the middle of that, I actually started it on a very nice election a few days ago, right? So the like this this you know this period of time includes the Mars Saturn, but I didn't start it with like Mars on the ascendant. That makes sense. Yeah, right. But no, it, like these are they, they're they're worth calculating. If it looked like, <clears throat> um, uh, if it looked like <clears throat> this configuration had my number. Right, like it was, you know, like directly on top of my X, Y, or Z. Um, then I probably wouldn't set up a thing that I would be doing. I would be, I would leave flex time to deal with the problems. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, and I like yours because yours is not exactly, even though that's going to be a, a a march, as you said, it's not exactly like you're not in danger by sitting down and like writing your book or something. So there isn't like right. the threat of mortal danger like death. I mean, I guess if like a stack of books like fell on top of you while you're editing your book, that would be Just tragic. Vicious, viciously bleeding paper cuts. Right. So we ne we never know. I mean, the weirder things have happened with astrology sometimes, but um, versus like if somebody was actually doing something that could be risky or something like that, and maybe that not being the best idea during the culmination of some of those difficult transits. Right. Yeah, like I wouldn't absolutely. get in a knife fight. Sure. You know, yeah. we'll try not to get in a knife fight, right? Save the knife fights for Mars Jupiter trines or something like that. Yeah, exactly. That's what Mars you're trining my natal Jupiter. All right. Then you'll get in a knife fight. Okay. That's good advice. Um, <laughs> all right. We're at an hour into this episode and we're halfway through the month. So I think we have to, to break and um, regroup and also mention our sponsor this month, which is the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanac, because it's that time of the year and it's like, Almost Christmas time, so all the astrologers are going to start scrambling to find uh, gifts for the astrology lovers in their life. And they sent us a beautiful little uh, promo video, which I wanted to show. So the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanac is launching a new feature that they're really emphasizing for their almanacs, which is they're integrating a community artist design section where you can actually get. Um, custom design work for each of their almanacs that come from different artists in the astrological community, which is a pretty cool feature. We were just looking at this right before the show, right? Yeah, it's really cool. Mm -hmm. The um, it, it I mean, e each each image set by itself is uh, pretty darn cool. But then 
the the fact that you can choose which style and which artists work uh, mm-hmm. you'd like on your calendar is, you know, honestly fantastic. Yeah, you can already customize the honeycombs like a lot, um, but this is just like next level. Yeah. So for those that don't know or haven't heard us mention them before, uh, the honeycomb, it's a personal astrological almanac and calendar, and it's actually tied in specifically with your birth chart. They have you submit your birth data to them when you order it so that it's completely personalized to you and your transits. So it does both natal and mundane transits in the time zone of your choice. It gives you unique data visualizations for different Hellenistic techniques like zodiac releasing, which is one of the things I love about it, as well as perfections. And uh, prices start at ten dollars for a digital almanac, or twenty-two for a printed almanac, or thirty for a wall calendar, which is pretty um, affordable and pretty nice to way to start the next year of twenty twenty-two, just in terms of getting a personalized version of your transits for the next year. So, um, thanks to Honeycomb, you can find out more information about that or order an almanac at honeycomb.co, or you can see the new um, artwork and the different options for that at art.honeycomb.co. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited about that. It's cool to have like actual sponsors and products that we actually like and enjoy, and that's one of the things I always try to shoot for with the podcast. Yeah, it's it's is- nice that you're not uh, selling dick pills. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, yeah, not yeah. People can, if that ever happens, people can criticize us. But um, so I far, mean, we just, could probably make it pretty funny. But um, right, but yeah. All right, we'll have to. Probably, we'll probably have to, better that we're doing honeycomb. We'll think about that and we'll brainstorm for future episodes. But in the meantime, um, everyone should get an almanac. All right, so we are halfway through the month of November, which just happens to be not a resting point, but happens to be like the culminating point of the entire month. Um, I think we need to now transition into that third week where we get the, I believe, the Mars Uranus opposition, and we get the eclipse. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so it's interesting with the the, the Mars Saturn, right? It's the you have that that peak tension between Mars and Saturn. Mars is pushing, Saturn is resisting, um, or Mars is acting and Saturn is attempting to order Mars and Mars doesn't like that. And then you get Mars Uranus, right? And then the, the Uranus is, you know, uh, <clears throat> it it often one of one of the, one of my go to metaphors for Uranus is like. You know, you're you're playing. You know, you're playing the, the board game, whatever it is, Monopoly. Um, and Saturn says these are the rules, and then Uranus just flips the board, right? And so some of the like tensions that we're seeing, like Mars Saturn, like yes, no, yes, no, will just kind of um, how should we say uh, become obsolete because the board gets flipped, mm-hmm. or will go out of control, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. That those simmering tensions will suddenly boil over. Yeah. Well, and also another thing that Uranus does is it adds sort of something from left field, right? We've got, you know, as we talked about with sort of the lead end to November, there are all of these known tensions, right? It's like, well, that's not going to go great based on where it is and what's coming up. But then Uranus will sometimes just add something that's out of the blue. Um, that again changes the whole thing, usually for the worse in a <laughs> in a configuration like this. Sometimes for the better, but like it, you know, like a little. There's often a, a game changing thing or a catalyzing thing. Um, I was thinking about this earlier. Um, we'll probably get some exciting weather disaster. There's got to be some some natural thing in addition to all of the human things. Wasn't there that like fire in the ocean during the last hard aspect? Yeah, that was in July when we had um, the what was it? it was Mars transiting through Leo, and it opposed Saturn and squared Uranus. And um, there was that was also one of the Saturn Uranus squares. It was in June, and there was that building collapse in Florida, and then there was that also that weird like oil fire um, in the middle of the ocean. I think it was down in the in the not the Pacific, but in the Caribbean, and it was like a huge. Hole that was like on fire in the ocean. Yeah, yeah, They're like yeah, right. The sometimes the astro weather is literally the weather, right? <laughs> um, so that Mars Uranus opposition goes exact on November seventeenth, 
Um, what are some other keywords for Mars Uranus? Unpredictable action, revolutionary actions, um, sudden breaking away. Yeah, like like fighting against something and the the rebelliousness or the need to um, almost like take up arms in rebellion against something can sometimes be a very literal manifestation of that. Yeah, well, in the um, what should we say? Mars already has a lot of rejection energy. Like, no, I don't want to do that. Fuck that, right? Like, um, and then Uranus also has a lot of rejection energy. And so sort of um, a, when we talk about Mars and igniting things or dealing with what's combustible, um, you know, Uranus, when it's presented as a fuel source is, you know, it's highly refined. It's not gasoline, it's jet fuel. Um, and when Mars, uh, Mars and Uranus come together, there's often a, a sudden release of a tremendous amount of energy, right? Mars on its own you know, can set a fire and keep it burning and spread it, but it's not necessarily as explosive and as sudden. Like the, the energy, a large amount of energy gets released all at one time when Uranus and Mars are involved, which is, you know, we, we talk about explosions. Yeah. Explosions can be sudden accidents. Unfortunately, there are oh, yeah. few manifestations that you can't really fully control, even if you're doing what you can. Well, and what you can control to some degree is we call it like your risk profile, right? Like how exposed to randomness are you? Because, you know, one of the things <laughs> astrology shows you um, is it gives you a good idea of like what the probability barometers are, right? And sometimes the, the randomness is more likely to, um, you know, to condense into uh, treats and good fortune. And sometimes the randomness is happy to throw out some unpleasant surprises. You know, it's the difference between like um, staying home or just going to like a heavily populated, crowded, open air area where you could have a thousand different interactions versus like if you're home, you know, you you have a baseline of order for your interactions with yourself and those who are, you know, who commonly visit, right? You've got a, a lower risk profile. Yeah, that actually reminds me of during the last hard aspect between Mars and Uranus uh, in the summer. I actually told my dad, um, "Let's not go visit my, you know, my mom was in the hospital for a bit this summer. Let's not go and drive out to visit because it's like an hour drive. Um, because there's like this hard aspect; it can be accidents." And so we, he was like, "Sure." I mean, I'm glad that my parents believe me in these things. <laughs> um, and so we didn't. What happened the next day was that one of their company's cars, they got into an accident and the car was totaled. And so wow. it wasn't us, you know, we were trying to kind of take it into account that risk profile, but it still can be in your sphere of influence, you know, or sphere of living, I guess, <laughs> not influence. Yeah. Yeah. Your biosphere. Yeah. You mentioning the, the bomb, uh, bombing bombs makes me think of the um, classic example as astrologers talk about of the um, development and the First use of the atomic bomb, I believe, was under a Mars Uranus conjunction in Gemini by the United States um, when the bomb on Hiroshima was dropped. And that was a replication of the Mars Uranus conjunction that's in the United States birth chart in Gemini. Yeah, and they were both in Gemini. And it was two bombs, right? Little mm -hmm. right, pair right. of twins. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's some of the energy which sometimes can manifest in a large mundane sense and other times in a more personal sense, depending on how it's hitting a person's birth chart. I guess we're talking about what 12 degrees of the fixed signs still when we're coming talking about the sensitive degrees for that opposition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, and on sort of um, living with it. You know, Mar the the experience um, when it's internal of Mars Uranus is like um, some a lot of times it feels like something which is irritating has become unendurable. I just can't take this anymore. I'm gonna lose my shit, right? Um, and just like you know, making a note that like oh, those are you might feel like losing your shit days, and you know it might be right to quit that job, quit that relationship, whatever. But it's worth like you know, waiting a day or two and see if you still feel the same way. Yeah, definitely. Just like the Mercury-Mars uh, conjunction. Right, right. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, this is just keyed up so perfectly that that Uranus energy is really emphasized that week because we do have the Mars Uranus. And then it's like two days later, right, that the eclipse happens um, in Taurus as well. So it's activating that Taurus Uranus energy twice within a couple of days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and look at this at the, the moon. I know. At the same time that Mars is opposing Uranus, it's like the moon swoops into Taurus so that it really highlights that. It's weird how the moon shows up um, in Twice. the sign that we're talking about. Yeah, like almost every mm -hmm. time this month. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of the reasons I was thinking this month would be it already looked intense, but that just like furthered it because the moon triggers it almost immediately every single time. Yeah, right. And it's like, oh, it's the day before the eclipse, right? It's like, no, it's um, <laughs> same energy, right? Mm -hmm. It's like there, there. It's not like with pretty much all of the moon and fixed signs this month. It's just this whole, mm, I don't know, mix of this Saturn, Uranus, Mars, and friends thing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So that brings us to the next major major event of the month, which is the lunar eclipse. In Taurus at 27 degrees of Taurus, which uh, looks like it goes exact here, November 19th. It may still be the 18th on the East Coast. So it's basically November 18th or 19th. We get that lunar eclipse in Taurus at 27, 27 Taurus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that the Sun squares Jupiter just a couple, a few days before, because that was one of the things I was looking forward to towards the end of the month. It's like, okay, but things then start applying to Jupiter, and that should lighten things a little bit. But in this case, you know, since that is so close to Jupiter, and both the sun and moon are um, at the eclipse time squaring Jupiter, it's almost just like it um, makes it whatever has been going on even bigger, like it inflates the conflagration or whatever. It's, yeah. Yeah, or, yeah, um, or perhaps it's an invalidation of, of what Jupiter has been trying to do because it's a very this eclipse energy is very contrary um, to like Jupiter and Aquarius's uh, sort of method of, of trying to help or improve things mm -hmm. mm. like right, this, keeping um, the peace. Yeah, so this is I believe this is a partial. It's partial but close to total, isn't it? Um, it's not a exactly total, but it's uh, I think it's like as. Uh, as complete as it can be without being technically uh, a total. Uh, I could be wrong. Um, but yeah, it's getting pretty close there to the nodes. Yeah. And so, and it's, it occurs uh, very close to the fixed star Kaput Algol, um, which has a pretty gnarly reputation, especially in terms of mundane charts and historical events. Right. There are humans who can work with it. Um, somewhat more, um, how should we say, um, constructively. But when it shows up in history, it often shows up at some uh, particularly nasty moments. Mm -hmm. mm. Right. Tell us, tell us about Algol. <laughs> Regale us with stories of of Algol's uh, history. Oh well, have you heard of the bombing of Guernica? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, um, that was an Algol moment. And what was interesting was that uh, Picasso, who has algal related things uh, in or had algal related things in his chart, um, then did the painting to commemorate the um, massive civilian death that happened then. Right. But um, but yeah, it's it's nasty. The um, the uh, the Chinese name for it, the name in Chinese astrology like translates loosely to like a trench for corpses. Um, the, you know, the, the, the symbol, which is commonly used, um, is the severed head of Medusa. The, um, you know, the name Algol is like Ras Al Ghul. Um, so that's the, the Arabic version and it's the same, uh, the root is ghoul. It's the same, uh, it's the same root as our word, like ghoul, like an undead being who devours corpses. Uh, it's also just called the demon's head, right. In some, uh, in some texts. And so, you know, Algol, like, it's a lot to handle. It's a very, like, primordial, um, potentially violent, um, often out of control energy, which is interesting because we've been talking about this, like, things getting out of control um, or Saturn, poor Saturn, uh, trying desperately to maintain order, right? And so we have this 
um, sort of um, out of the, uh, how do I say this, like downpour of potentially out of control uh, energy. Um, one thing I will also say about Algol, Algol is also very sort of anti-civilized in the in a conscious sense of being like, what is the price of all of this? Like, is this was this even worth it? Should we have done the agriculture and built a class structure? And you know, it's sort of like, what is the? There, there's something um, sort of um, primitivist, you know, meaning like what, the, the, meaning that there's a, a critical take on like you know, this whole civilization project. And so like that heavy rain coming down, like in the same sign as Uranus, there seems like there's a lot of, how should we say, agreement between between Uranus and this eclipse on Algol in the same sign. And this is, of course, the first of the Taurus Scorpio series. And so it's, you know, it's a big event in and of itself, but it's also the introduction of a cycle that's going to run for the next year and a half, basically. Yeah, that's really important um, because even though the fixed signs have already been having some heavy transits, and for example, Taurus has been Uranus has been transiting through Taurus over the past couple of years, past two, two or three years. Um, this is the beginning of a new eclipse series that's going to bounce back and forth in six month increments between Taurus and Scorpio. That should be very important um, for those with heavy fixed sign placements or those that have the Taurus Scorpio axis uh, important in their chart or prominent in their chart for some reason, whether it's through it being one of those being the rising sign or, or what have you. If those are angular signs for you, that's going to be the beginning of, um, of a, a sequence of opening up those topics in your life and some major new developments in that area. Mm hmm. Yeah. Eclipses, you know, often have some overlap with Uranus transits in that eclipses often do bring unpredictable things, things you weren't expecting or weren't expecting yet. Um, and those can be good unexpected things as well as, you know, things you don't want. Um, and so it just has that overlap, um, just like we're talking about again with Uranus being in the same sign and Uranus also being things you were un not expecting or sudden or unexpected um, things. So yeah, there's just going to be a lot of that piling up. Yeah, and in terms of like uh, what notable charts that that hits, as I was saying before, the EU chart has the moon at 24 Taurus, um, and so this eclipse is exact two and a half degrees away, and that's in the tenth house of the EU chart, right? And so the the suggestion there um, is, you know, within a couple of weeks of the eclipse, who knows, maybe on the day of the eclipse, but. Sometimes the, the eclipses take a little bit to play out. Um, we would expect serious, um, serious challenges to the um, sort of uh, the sovereign integrity of the EU project, right? And tenth house is like the in a in a nation or a combination of nations is like the the sort of centralizing power or the centralized power. So we would expect with an eclipse there that you know there's some uh, there's some bumps in that road some challenges to that idea of unity. Yeah, on a more uh, personal level, I always talk about eclipses as being great beginnings and great endings. And it's interesting that this eclipse series begins with a lunar eclipse, which is typically more of like a culmination of something that started earlier. So um, think about what house Taurus falls in your chart, especially what whole sign house, and what some of the significations are associated with that house. And you may see a culmination of events, or potentially in some instances, some kind of ending in order to make way for a new beginning that will really ramp up six months later once we get the next set of uh, Taurus Scorpio eclipses during the middle part of next year. Mm -hmm. Here's some significations of the houses diagram for those watching the video version, just for what significations might be more prominent to you with this eclipse. Mm -hmm. And we've been kind of talking about it in dire ways for the last few minutes or so, but um, it is important to know that sometimes the beginnings or endings can be mini culminations. You know, they can be culminations within a larger project um, or with a, within a larger experience or within a larger relationship or things of that nature. And so it can be chapters book being bookended by the eclipses. It's not necessarily like, you know, 100% beginning or end. Sometimes it is, but not always, just to alleviate worries. Yeah. 
um, like sometimes it can be like the end of a paragraph within a chapter instead of being like the end of an entire chapter of your life. Exactly. It's certainly a, a very strong introduction to <laughs> the uh, the Taurus Scorpio series. It is, and it, it's worth noting that this is one of those. This eclipse cycle is season is one of those sort of um, between signs where we have the. Um, two weeks after this, we have the the last um, Gemini Sagittarius eclipse, and that's paired with the first Taurus Scorpio eclipse. So this is sort of between cycles, right? Where it's like we're in, and this is kind of one of the fun things about eclipses. You get not irregularly this situation where you're sort of beginning a new, you know, eighteen months, while at the same just before you end, right? The the beginnings and endings are kind of. Um, uh, how do we say entangled and don't necessarily go A B C. Sometimes it's C and oh yeah, we need to finish B, and mm -hmm. then we'll move on to D. For sure, yeah, yeah. That's really important because it's like the um, mutable signs then are wrapping up those that eclipse series in December, and some of those great beginnings and great endings are going to be finalized, especially when the nodes then move out of. The Sagittarius and Gemini axis, but then the fixed signs are ramping up some new fa major phase of their life as the eclipses like move into that sector of their chart. Mm -hmm. So one thing I always have to mention once we start getting into uh, talking about eclipse season is that Lisa and I actually did a workshop at the Mercury Cafe once, and I released a recording of it um, for. Uh, the podcast, and that was episode I think two fifteen. It was titled "Interpreting Solar and Lunar Eclipses in Your Birth Chart." That's available on our channel on YouTube, and it was actually a really good workshop on eclipses because what it was on was talking to audience members and having them share their story about how transiting eclipses when they were bouncing back and forth between pairs of houses in their chart for a year and a half or so, um, what sort of events came up actually in their life, and it was a good. Demonstration, I think, of how sometimes eclipses work as indicating part of an ongoing sequence of events or a story about a certain chapter of their life that then unfolds as the eclipses are happening in those signs. So people should check that out. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it really is that textbook. We didn't, you know, screen ahead of time for good stories. We just like threw it out there and, you know, heard what they said, and it all really lined up. Yeah, it's, uh, eclipse stories are good, and you know, in, in terms of thinking about them um, as sort of uh, key points in narratives, one thing to note is that they tend to be the the shifts tend to be jarring. Um, they're not necessarily a smooth ride. Like, in, you know, thinking of some of the stories, it's like, and that's when I moved all the way across the country to a place that where I didn't know anybody, or that's where this thing that I thought I'd been doing for a long time just totally fell out from under me. Um, you know, the, they're, you know, when we're looking at the, the, the sort of natural language of eclipses, um, they're rare, dramatic and intense. Um, and what's, I don't know what what always sort of fascinate. One of the things that's fascinating about them is that while visually they appear as an anomaly, right? It's most new moons and full moons aren't eclipsed. Um, if we're if we sort of back up and look at the Sun Moon Earth system, um, they're actually more perfect, right? There are actually more perfect alignments between the Sun Moon and Earth. It's actually the imperfection, the fact that the moon's a little high or a little low that allows for what we would call normal. Um, but an eclipse is actually a, you know, a most perfect alignment. Um, and that's part of where the power comes from. You can just draw a straight line, sun, moon, earth, whereas usually you got to wiggle the line a little bit during a new moon or a full moon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned moving somebody, you were just throwing out a hypothetical example of somebody moving across the country. But I remember um, a Taurus eclipse way back in late 2004. And at that time, I made the decision to move from Denver to Seattle to study so I could be closer to Kepler College and access their library. And that was also the beginning then of a, another major move that happened six months later when I was invited to go out to Project Hindsight. And then I moved to Maryland and lived there for two years. But it all started with uh, a Taurus eclipse. I believe it was this eclipse right here around October 27th, 2004. And with my Aquarius rising chart at the time, I was 
debating um, Holstein houses at the time because I was actually skeptical for the first year after I heard the concept from Rob Hand and I rejected it because I used Placidus. But this was the first time where, um, because I ended up moving shortly after that eclipse, that was one of the first things that made me like look at Holstein houses and realize there was something to it because my IC is in Gemini, and so I shouldn't have been moving then if that eclipse in my fourth whole sign house wasn't indicating something about my living situation. Yeah, yeah, and that was um, that was a return for you too. That was your natal um, nodal cycle. Oh yeah, yeah, with North Node in Taurus. Yeah, yeah. So eclipses, major beginnings and major endings. That was an example of like a major beginning for me in like moving across the country and beginning a sequence of moves that would change my life. And I would shortly, as a result of that, be introduced to Hellenistic astrology and then go study a translation project. And actually, while living at that translation project, would meet you, Austin, when you came out for one of the first conclaves at Project Hindsight. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So good, good times. Um, all right. So that is that eclipse that's taking place. I did mean to show the eclipse graphic. Since we're wrapping it up here at this point, we had our first two eclipses in Sag and Gemini earlier this year in May and June. We've got that Taurus eclipse on November 19th at 27 Taurus. And then our last eclipse of the year will take place on December 4th in the sign of Sagittarius. And that will be the very last of the Sag Gemini eclipses. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move on. So once we get past that eclipse, I feel like things start calming down and we start moving into a little bit less tense phase of the month, right? Yeah. I'm really looking yeah. forward to the end of November. And I think that's what people have to kind of keep their sight out for is just like make it to the end of November. <laughs> Whatever is kind of getting stirred up in the middle. It will it will get better. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily know that we would be grateful for the configurations at the end of November during another month, but because we're grading on like a, a November like sliding scale bell curve, <laughs> right. um, it looks it it looks um, much it looks um, less unfavorable and maybe right. even slightly favorable relative to the rest of the month. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, if anything else, it's just some of the planetary activity dies down. I mean, if you look at this archetypal explorer readout, there's just so much going on in that second and third week of November, and then we start to move out of some of the intensity of all of those really major aspects happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we get. I mean, so the th things to like, right, is um, we have the the sun just moving out of Scorpio is useful because it's just. The less we have uh, in fixed signs, <laughs> the the better with uh, with this particular setup. Um, and then Mercury following the sun out is nice, just like you know, um, depressurizing the the fixed sign axis, right? Because mm -hmm. it's like there's already been way too much there, right? Right. And then as soon as everything moves into Sagittarius, uh, you know, one by one, they suddenly are ruled by Jupiter, which while is in the fixed sign is still benefic. And um, yeah, and then you can see on that graph earlier that you know, the activity just goes down. You can relax a little bit from probably what will be a little too frenetic before that point. Yeah. So we see yeah, Mercury. It's more, I, I, I'm getting a sense of like sort of processing. Mm. The things that all, you know, everything that got activated and put into play. Right. Yeah. And also just exhaling. I mean, there's so much tension that seems like a big inhale, sort of holding your breath and, you know, grinning and bearing it to get through the middle of the month, but then having a moment to exhale, especially once the Sun and Mercury get out of Scorpio and get out of that axis of the fixed signs. Mars starts moving away from Uranus and Saturn. And yeah, um, so we do finally at this point, and this would be a good opportunity to mention our electional chart for the month because Lisa and I did the Auspicious Elections podcast, which is one of the private podcasts we do for patrons through our page on Patreon each month. And we were trying to find, we usually try to find a good selection of like charts throughout the month. So you have at least one electional chart for each week, but we had a really hard time recommending anything, frankly, in the middle of the month. That people start any like you know getting married or starting a business or something like that in terms of major ventures, 
And most of our best electional charts, we ended up focusing on the very end of the month. Once some, once some of that stuff moves into Sagittarius, as just a better time for beginning new ventures and undertakings. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the only time we've ever done that since we've started the electional podcast. Is like skip the entire middle of the month. Yeah, not had more of an even distribution. Well, that's sometimes you know the advice if we're giving advice about when to start things using electional astrology. Sometimes the advice is. Do not start things during this time, which makes me think of like, you know, ancient Babylonian astrologers, and you find finding cuneiform tablets that like tell the king to like do nothing during this period of time or what have you. Definitely, yeah, yeah. Well, there's like there's that case for the negative space of electional astrology, where you know the positive side is um, uh, doing or initiating something at the best possible time. But that is no more, but and no less valuable than simply not doing things at terrible times, right? If you can just cut out like the worst twenty percent of your timing, you'll have huge benefit. Mm, and that's often what really you're doing is kind of like chiseling out marble. You're like cutting away the things that are bad times, you know, and you're finding the like the least bad times. <laughs> yeah, or you're like you know, going through the the potatoes that you bought and you're just like cutting out the rotten parts or throwing away, you know, some of the fruit that's actually gone off. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So, so much of the time we think about electional astrology as telling people when to act, but sometimes it can be also when not to act. So in terms of when to act, um, what is our electional chart for this month, Lisa? It is November 27th. And oh, sorry, that's the 29th, November 29th, around 4 15 p.m. And this is going to be an early Gemini rising chart. Okay. Yeah. So we've got that. And then also there's a couple variations for mm-hmm. this month. There's also the moon trine Jupiter one. Um, let's do both of them. So the, the main one, let's do the, the moon trine Jupiter. So it's November 30th around 4.15 PM, just before sunset, mm-hmm. in order to make this a day chart. So take this chart and set it for your location on November 30th, and then set it for 4.15 PM, and then adjust the ascendant until it's around, let's say, four degrees of Gemini, definitely no, no later than eight degrees of Gemini in order to keep this as a day chart. Uh, mm-hmm. Since it's just before sunset, so it'll create a chart where the ruler Gemini is rising. The ruler of the ascendant is Mercury, which is over in Sagittarius in the seventh whole sign house, coming off of a conjunction with the Sun and a sextile with Saturn. Um, the Moon is in later Libra, and it's applying to a uh, trine with Jupiter in a day chart, which is pretty auspicious. Um, we have the degree of the midheaven here in Colorado is. Around the degree of Saturn and just past it, which is acceptable because it's a day chart. We'd like to put Jupiter on the degree of the midheaven, and and that is possible. But you just have to be careful about an hour later that you don't do things early so that the midheaven is squaring Mars. So um, we also run into an issue because it switches to a day char- or a night chart at that point, which is more problematic in terms of Saturn and less benefic in terms of the Moon's application to Jupiter. So that's why. We're probably recommending keeping this as a day chart just before sunset on November 30th. Mm, you've got uh, the moon is between aspects to Venus and Jupiter. Right. Well, yeah, it it's... depends if we count Pluto. Um, we're going we're gonna to ignore, ignore Pluto for the sake of this <laughs> experiment. Traditional rules only. Right. Which is, it's a nice, it's very nice for the moon to be protected like that, but moving between one benefic and the other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and especially since the day chart moving from the benefic contrary to the sect and applying to a trine with the benefic of the sect in favor is pretty favorable. Um, what are some of the things that this chart might be recommended for? Well, ninth house things for sure, with Jupiter in a day chart in the ninth and Saturn in its own sign there. So um, things involving higher education, learning that is supposed to take a long time. Um, would be a great ninth house thing. It can be long distance travel, but it would be more for like work rather than pleasure with Saturn there. Um, astrology actually would be a great, someone just said, I'll start a cult. Uh, yeah, you could do that. Um, <laughs> but ast- uh, wait, astrological wait for Jupiter ventures. Jupiter Pisces to start a cult. <laughs> right. Oh, right. Conjunct Neptune. Yeah. <laughs> um, astrological ventures with the ninth house also would be good. Um, 
And maybe even, you know, ninth house things that involve client work, of course, because the ascendant ruler is in the seventh of the other party, one-on-one -on -one interactions. And also there's that emphasis in the ninth house. So there, there can potentially, at least for some people, be a blend of like consulting or one-on-one -on -one work and ninth house matters, which certainly would be, you know, astrological consulting would be great. Yeah. Um, education, it's not a bad chart for finances as well because the second house is ruled by the moon, which is applying to that trine with Jupiter while the moon itself is placed in the fifth whole sign house, which is the in Hellenistic astrology, the place of good fortune. So you can't always get that where the ruler of the ascendant and the ruler of the second are decently placed, but sometimes when you can, it's nice to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's our electional chart for for November. We found a few other charts. Uh, during the course of the month, there's a couple at the beginning of the month. There's a couple. There's a few. Most of them, honestly, are, are at the end of the month. Once you get out of a, once you get all out of all of that stuff, and some of those aspects are separating rather than applying, and um, people can access those other elections through our page on Patreon. If you go to Patreon.com/slash/AstrologyPodcast, and we also just finished our year ahead electional report where we went through. Each of the next 12 months of 2022, and we picked out one auspicious electional chart for each of the next 12 months, where we actually tried to find what is the single best chart for each of the next 12 months of 2022. And that was a lot of fun. Um, we spent a lot of time on it, but we actually just launched that report today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we actually put it out really early this time, um, relatively speaking, in late October instead of like December. So there's lots of good time for planning ahead with the report. Um, I think we actually gave a lot more variants this year as well. So I, I counted up the total number of charts, and there's actually 19, not 12. So you know, with the sort of you know next day variants and so forth, or alternate charts. So there's a lot. There's kind of a wealth of you know options in there to plan ahead for your 2022 year. Yeah, in order to account adjust for certain time zones where our primary chart looked good but wouldn't work in some time zones, we gave variant charts. So. There's a chart for just about every month. Um, so people can find that. We released it through the course site on theastrologyschool.com this year. So go to courses.theastrologyschool.com slash courses slash 2022 elections. How is that for a URL? Uh, to find that report, and you'll get immediate access to it as soon as you purchase it. And you can download it as an MP3, a video, and a written report. All right, so that is bringing us to the home stretch of November of 2021. Um, what are some of the last aspects that we have to talk about as we talk about the very end of the month and before we head into December? I think one major one that we, I think you mentioned Austin early on, that's really building up at this point by the time we get to late November is the Venus transit through Capricorn and getting ready for that station, that retrograde station conjunct Pluto, right? Yeah, Venus has really slowed down at this point. And even though the retrograde station doesn't come until well into December, <clears throat> Venus is sort of approaching the degrees that she'll be in for quite some time, right? By the end of the month, Venus is already at 20. And so sitting right there with Pluto. And so we're kind of getting introduced to you know, it's going to be basically a solid month of Venus conjunct Pluto, um, you know, direct and then retrograde. And that's really, that's a tone that, you know, that that's a tone that's just going to be there through the holidays, mm -hmm. right? Um, like a Venus retrograde is a thing, is a, is a vibe in and of itself, but mm -hmm. Venus retrograde very closely within a degree conjunct Pluto is, is a whole other vibe. Or I, I would say it's this, it's almost a doubling down. You know, when we're looking at Venus retrograde stories, it's very it's very like underworld caverns of the heart. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Venus. Uh, you know, in terms of the the literal, <sighs> the visuals that then lead us to you know a metaphoric underworld interpretation. You know what this is going to look like, and you can watch this all through November. Is Venus being um, present uh, and bright in the Western horizon just after the sun sets? and then sinking and dimming a little bit every day until there's a disappearance, right? And then a period of absence. And then later towards the direct station side, you'll see Venus rise again in the east, right? But you know, the, the visual is 
on the planet's brightness, dropping, dropping, dropping to the western horizon, disappearing, and then appearing again on the other side of the Earth, right? And so you have that like Inanna Arish Kigal story and, and structure. The descent descent into the underworld. Yeah. And it's you know, it's similar to Mercury retrograde. A Mercury retrograde has the same visual structure. Um, and in Mercury's underworld are right all of the all of the the mail you forgot to open the you know the the uh, the conversations you let drop um, on purpose or uh, accidentally. But Venus's underworld has um, significantly more emotionally impactful material, right? You know, it's um, the the ghosts of of, of lovers past. Um, you know, uh, passions, unrequited, you know, desires, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's, you know, it's just, it's all Venus stuff and it's all like, it's all feeling dense. Right. And so if we're just doing, you know, what's in the underworld, um, and then we add Pluto to that, I would say it's not, um, it's not a different vibe. It's a double down on that vibe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. It also looks to me like the uncovering of secrets, with the uh, Venus Pluto leading into the retrograde, you know the uncovering of secrets that can then cause you to reevaluate relationships or things like that, or the attempts to keep secrets. Um, yeah, just working yeah, which through don't all. Don't tend that. to go as well during this period. What do you say? I said, oh, uh, which don't tend to go as well. The the right. keeping of like that's what Venus retrograde is about. It's like, oh, right. what was buried? Let's find mm-hmm. out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So obsessions, taboos, um, things of that nature. Obsession is a really good keyword. That's a, a one that always I think of when I think of Venus Pluto. That it can be mm-hmm. really obsessive, uh, especially for like love interests, and sometimes that can go in a good way of of you know being taken to extremes. Is like the the Romeo and Juliet scenario of like wanting being willing at least to go to the ultimate extreme of like dying for somebody. Let's say. In a mm-hmm. version of that, that's yeah. I, I don't know if um, um, uh, suicide packed teenage love is <laughs> qualifies. I mean, as I, like I'm, I'm just I'm just saying there's a version of that that might be romantic in a certain context versus there's the version of that that is not romantic that is the going too far in relationships of you know being obsessed in love but is the object of your desire is that um, returned is that reciprocal or is it mm-hmm. one person being Overly obsessed and attached to another person, and not being willing to let go of that, or not, let's say, taking it to inappropriate extremes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And with this one, I think there's also a lot that speaks to um, some of the the pain of, like you said, like the pain of non relationship, like the pain of isolation when you would like to not be isolated, because this is you know Venus and Pluto in a Saturn ruled sign, um, and there can be something a little a little grim. And if we're talking about the the underworld caverns, right? There's like sort of being stuck down here emotionally and not mm-hmm. being able to connect to people. And yeah, you know, if you really have a point. depressive bent as I do exactly half the time, um, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to, you know, be prepared to deal with those kind of feelings. I mean, what's interesting about it though, is this is still building up in late November. So we, we won't see the culmination of that. It's like some of those the direction that that's heading, you're getting there by late November because Venus ingressed a while earlier. Um, but the it's like some of the, the the relationship or the sequence of events running relationship or love or attachment or what have you is still being set up, and it's right on the verge of coming to the culmination that it sort of comes to at some point in December. But it's not quite there yet. The pieces, the chess pieces, are still being put in place. Mm-hmm, for sure. I was thinking also with the need for long-term planning and kind of Venus and Capricorns, like, what's the plan here for us, you know? Um, and especially with regard to potentially tying into finances, um, you know, with a Pluto and Capricorn transit overall having so much to do with finances and disparities in income and things like that, I could see the Venus-Pluto you know, as a natal signature can be like attraction to wealth or power, and so there could be elements of that coming into play as well. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I think that's. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of that in terms of how it looks collectively. The like those um, the those structures and how the resources <laughs> um, are allocated or 
um, controlled or whatever. Um, <clears throat> I would also add that, you know, with um, the Saturnian influence here, this occurring in a Saturnian sign, sometimes you can have that like, I'm I'm walled in, right? I'm stuck, nobody can see me. But then you can also have the like, I'm walled in to this structure of relationship with a person where you're like, oh, I have feelings of being like stuck in patterns that need to be revisited will definitely be something X number of people are going to get out of this one. Right. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So that's building up. And the Venus retrograde, of course, is, is famously 40 days and 40 nights. And we don't see that station until later on in December. But it's kind of interesting that there's going to be this low key buildup of this that actually begins on November 5th, as soon as Venus moves into Capricorn, because then it begins its slow build up to that conjunction with Pluto and it begins its co presence in the same sign as Pluto. So people should sort of pay attention to that because it's going to be one of those instances where. You have that. One of the things I talked about on the podcast uh, on aspects with Claire Moon earlier this month is just that difference between sign based aspects and degree based aspects. And it's true that the degree based aspects often coincide with the actual event and with the greatest intensification of the transit where where things are the most acute and the most obvious. But if you pay attention, um, the events that sort of culminate. At that exact aspect, often start to build up as soon as the two planets moved into the sign based configuration. So people should pay attention to this Venus ingress just because there will be some back, background events that sort of lead into things, even if they don't come to full culmination until the actual Venus station in December. Yeah, and it's interesting if we want to look at the span of the Venus retrograde, um, it'll base, uh, Venus will go back to 11. Um, for the direct station. And so if we're looking at when does Venus pass 11 degrees, it's like November 18th, right? Wow. So okay. we're, you know, we're, we're in the, <clears throat> we're in those degrees, which will be visited three times, right? Beautiful. Ghosts of, uh, go- in this case, very literally ghost of Christmas past, present and future. <laughs> right. That's beautiful. So right around the time of the Mars Uranus opposition and the eclipse is when Venus enters her retrograde shadow. Yeah. Good good catch. All right. And then December, we see Venus stationing retrograde there, conjunct Pluto at 26 degrees of Capricorn, December 18th. And then it begins its 40 days and 40 nights of the retrograde period, where it starts moving back towards the sun, begins its whole descent into the underworld phase, which is sort of doubly emphasized, as Austin was saying, by the conjunction with Pluto, the god of the underworld. At the same time, eventually conjoins the sun in January, and then eventually at some point emerges from under the beams of the sun and the underworld, and and eventually stations here. It looks like in late January. Yeah, and so you know, as 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 everyone's living through um, Venus slowly edging towards the actual retrograde turn, um, I've often found it very helpful to just kind of pay attention. Because if you're paying attention, you're often not terribly surprised by whatever events are, you know, are part of the retrograde proper. You know, these things brew for a while. And if you're not paying attention or trying to not pay attention, um, then you may get a big surprise. But if you're just kind of keeping an ear to the Venusian in your life and whatever house area that is for you, um, (laughs) <laughs> you're you're less likely to be shocked and more likely to be kind of ready to do that even if you don't love it. Yeah, isn't that basically being an astrologer is just sitting there and sipping your tea and saying, "Oh yeah, that makes sense." Like yeah. that, that, well, that's, like, not, that's not know, it's the not being surprised, right? Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> Developing a, a detached sense of non-surprising, non-surprisal. Mm-hmm. Well, it's um, you know, it's 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 one thing to be in a fight, it's another thing to be ambushed. True, true. Uh, and then, of course, we have to mention with a, a Venus retrograde, one of the ways to not be surprised, of course, is to think back eight years earlier. And you will see uh, that there was a Venus retrograde in roughly the same spot in the zodiac. Um, so, this would have been in the December 2013 timeframe, was the last time that Venus stationed retrograde in Capricorn. So you can take it back to that, or you can take it back to eight years prior to that, or eight years prior to that. And sometimes you'll see 
echoes of the same Venus retrograde, especially if you're tied into that cycle and have personal points around those degrees, then it can be much more important for you. Yeah. One thing that's interesting is that this one, not too long ago, used to start in early Aquarius, but it's climbed back so that the start is in late Capricorn. And I noticed the the difference because I have Venus in very early Aquarius. And so the this cycle, when it used to start in Aquarius, was actually much more impactful. And I was happy when it when it moved back into Capricorn, where it was, it, you know, it's still a Venus retrograde, it still matters. Um, but it, you know, it's a little bit different. So some of the like if I think it was if you go 16 years ago, then you're looking at a, an Aquarius start. But I think the eight years ago was the first uh, Capricorn only start. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I think you're right because it moves about two or three degrees every time. Yeah. Just slowly inches. Yeah. Well, we will talk more about that and probably do a much deeper dive into Venus retrograde and retrograde periods when we do our next uh, forecast episode, which will be sometime later in November when we do the forecast for December. And then the following month, we will do our entire year ahead forecast for 2022, which usually doubles as the January forecast. All right. I think that brings us to the end of this episode and the end of our discussion about the astrology of November. Is there anything else that we we missed? Um, just at the very end of the month, Neptune stations. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a good. Just forgetting good about point. Neptune. That's a good. <laughs> good Always impact. overlooking Neptune. Um, yeah. So here, let me pull that up. Neptune stations and also Venus is configured to Neptune. What by sextile? Yeah, sextiles it on the same day at 20 degrees. Yeah, and it's also kind of sextile Mars, like not exact yet, but very close within about a degree. So it feels like there's a little bit of like cooling off. I feel like with the Neptune station at the end, especially after so much eruption, potential eruption this month, it's like either a, a sigh of relief or like a numbing out. Like or both. Yeah, well, it's like it doesn't necessarily change the events in play, but it's like here, take these two I- ibuprofen and then see if you know what you think about exactly the same things happening. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. It's just like a little little bit of a little bit of a painkiller. Yeah. Yeah. Or or like R and R, a little rest and relaxation with Venus sextiling Mars and sextiling Neptune and just the the piece of of taking a little bit of a break before we head into some of the more important and and again a little bit more tense aspects of December, which are the eclipse and the third exact Saturn Uranus square, and also the Venus stationing retrograde conjunct Pluto. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like the end of the n- end of November is like take a couple of days off, watch movies all day. It's that kind of energy. Right. Yeah. Get a massage and take it easy and. Gear up for the last month of e- month of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing we didn't mention at all that we meant to actually in terms of that was just um, in other months. So much of the the pandemic has been the hard aspects between Mars and Saturn, and that you know we're heading into the last two months of the year. We're heading into the period where we would already expect the sort of cold and flu season to exacerbate things in the northern hemisphere and in the U.S. And with Mars and Saturn again moving into a hard aspect, we would expect with some of the the COVID stuff, like a increase of that presumably as well during this time, during this like month and a half or two month period. Yeah, for sure. It's kind of lined up like clockwork in the past. I went back and looked when like all of the original shutdowns happened at the beginning of the pandemic, and it was like all within a few days or so of this, at least in the US, all of the different states did their shutdowns within a few days of the Mars-Saturn conjunction. And then the squares had kind of like smaller blips of that as well. So, um, you know, some greater restriction potentially around that or precautions, even if not restriction outright. Well, and that 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 plays into all of the other stuff that we're talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's you know it, it it's you know something that I think this last two years has made extremely clear is when you're looking for rough situations, you don't just look for one planet misbehaving. You look for where a bunch of stuff all comes together at the same time in a you know in a, I don't know sort of a a delightful synergy, right? Like a, a complicated nuanced, delicate hell broth, right? Where it's not just one ingredient. Right. 
Uh, mm-hmm. Can that be the title of this episode? I'll attribute that to you, like de- delightful synergy of Hellbroth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Hellbroth on the stove. Um, Hellbroth's almost ready. <laughs> Yeah. yeah that's Shit good. layer cake is pretty good. <laughs> but there have to be other there there has to be like um maybe medical waste on one layer and then you know human shit on another. You need you need to have multiple ingredients. The hell broth mm. is served. A ladle full of hell broth. Okay. Well, thank you for <laughs> ending with that metaphor. Uh well, everyone good luck and stay safe during the course of November. Um, I hope everyone has a good month and makes it through all right and gets what they have to get done during the middle parts of the month. And uh, you know, just remember that there will be an end, end to it. And that's one of the most positive things about astrology and the helpful things is just knowing sometimes the time frame in which things are the most intense can sometimes give you uh, some idea of the duration and that there's a light at the end of the tunnel in most instances. So that's always something that's good to keep in mind. Yeah, it's huge. I think it's huge. You know, if when you don't have a time frame, all suffering, um, how should we say, it, threatens to become infinite, where you're like, oh, this is just what it is. It's like, no, this is what it is for exactly nine and a half more days. Can you do nine and a half days? Probably. Like, can you do an infinity? I don't know. Probably not. Um, I, I found that to be very helpful on a on a mental health level. It's you know it's like uh, it's like with push-ups. If I say if someone says do push-ups until well, there's no end point. You're like I don't know if I can do that many. Where if somebody's like okay, do a hundred, you can break them into sets if you want. You'd be like that's a lot of fucking push-ups. But you know like it there's a there's an end in sight. Um, and I think from a like managing your cognition sort of point of view, there's a, an infinite difference between well, it might never end. Right. Versus like just do a hundred. Right. Yeah. I think that's huge for November of this year and months like November where it's kind of like boxed in and you know when it begins and when it ends and you're like, okay, I can get through that versus if you have no idea, which is, uh, you know, the great thing about knowing astrology, otherwise you have no idea and you're like, oh my God, life is terrible forever. So Yeah. Right. That What is that? That's uh, I read about that in some Buddhist text a long time ago as sort of the mistake of eternalizing a particular experience, and that that was like a an error of the mind to to be on the lookout for. Right. All right. Awesome. Well, this is a lot of fun. Thank you both for joining me today for this. This is great. Uh, thanks, Lisa, for joining us for this forecast episode. Yeah. yeah thanks for having is, me. Uh, it was great. This is not a not a not a not an easy episode to premiere on. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. <laughs> no, you did great. Yeah. Um, all right. What do you both have coming up this month, um, Austin? I believe Caitlin said uh, there's an article on the Sphere and Sundry site about remediating eclipse things that might be useful for people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Kate did a really nice write up of uh, a variety of different strategies for managing managing things during an eclipse during eclipse season. Um, I am going to be locked in a steel cage, manacled to the text I need to edit to get uh, the second edition of Faces actually done. Um, let's see, Kate will be preparing to release a new Regulus series, not in the next couple of weeks, maybe end of the month, maybe beginning of next month. Um, but other than that, I'll be teaching my classes and chained to my workbench. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Uh, sounds that good. sounds good. I know people are, are dying to get that book. That book is so scarce. Well, I, I, will, like, I, I, I have now joined them and I will be dying to get it done. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's going for like hundreds of dollars on the, there's like a black market surrounding your De- Deacon's book at this point. I yeah. Think. The, the secondhand market is um, absurd, but in a way that's like kind of complimentary. <laughs> right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> You were telling me the other day that you mentioned to like a high school friend that your book was like going for like hundreds of dollars on eBay right now, and he didn't believe you. Yeah, well, it was somebody I hadn't talked to in a long time, and he's like, "Oh, you know," he was talking about like kind of what do I do for a living and how do I pay bills, and I was like, "Well, it's classes and books," and he's like, "What? You wrote a book?" And I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> look it up online." And he's like, "Why is your book four hundred dollars?" Right, because it's very scarce. Because there was a limited print run at the beginning, but you'll be rectifying that soon and I know it's you've read on the illustrations and it looks really good. Thank you. Yeah, mm-hmm. it'll it'll be really I'm I'm really excited about the work um uh, Grant Hanna did. Yeah. Uh speaking of books, I I see a very rare 
uh, typo uh, book, uh, part two of Demetra's book sitting on your bookshelf, Lisa, that you're proofreading right now with your yes. uh, your Virgo moon that knows no bounds. Right. Yeah. It's so one of maybe like a few proof copies available right now. Okay. Well, that's very highly uh, prized then at some point. So that book hopefully will be out before too long. You're doing final proofreading on that. You're actually mm-hmm. so good at proofreading that you mentioned before we started chatting that you reached a new like Virgo Moon ach- achievement or unlocked one where you found a typo in the ephemeris. I did. <laughs> I found a typo in the ephemeris for next year, <laughs> which is ridiculous. Um, since it's an entire book of like numbers and symbols and that is all on there in tiny print. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. So heads up for anyone who has the American ephemeris. 1950 to 2050 at noon next December. There is a typo in the retrograde of Mer- Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I well, don't actually like exult in this. It's just like something that happens. Like I see them easily. It's not something that's like desirable. <laughs> yeah, well, that is bizarre, and I'm both impressed and terrified at your ability <laughs> to notice minute details like that. Um, what do you have coming up that you're going to be working on in November? Well, um, we did, as you mentioned earlier, just finish um, as of like last night, the uh, year ahead electional report. So we just got that out today. I'm pretty excited to launch that. And um, so that that has an election for every month. Um, I actually also just got invited recently to give a workshop at the ESAR conference next year um, on electional astrology. So that's pretty cool. It'll be a pre-conference workshop. Um, hopefully in person this time. It's been put off for a couple of years. So, um, but it's going to be in Westminster, Colorado, just outside of Denver. Um, so it's kind of nice for us. It's in late August. I don't remember the exact date. It's something like the 25th to 29th, something like that. Um, so yeah, so I hope some people who've been interested in elections from watching the podcast or watching the electional podcast in particular come and join me and talk elections before the conference. I think they just opened registration for that. So it's esar2022.org, and it looks like the dates are August 25th through the 29th, 2022, in Westminster, Colorado. Mm-hmm. And um, Austin, I think they also recently announced NORWAC, and you're, you're doing NORWAC next year in Seattle in May, right? Yeah, I'll be doing a pre conference workshop and two talks. Nice. Brilliant. The website for that is norwac.net. And the dates are May 26th through the 30th. I am really looking forward to conferences happening in person again and, and seeing a lot of friends in person for the first time in a few years uh, next year. That should be really good. Yeah, mm-hmm. be really good. Yeah. Um, so as for me, uh, I'm moving towards that. I'm getting excited about Jupiter moving into Pisces next year, and I want to start interviewing people in person more. Uh, one of the things that I did recently in order to move towards that is I restructured and refreshed my Patreon tiers. So if people like the podcast, they watch it regularly and they want to support that, I'm going to hopefully next year start flying people out for in-person interviews here in Denver, just because you can get so much better audio and video quality when people are sitting here in person, as you can see on some of my previous studio episodes. So if you want to support that, go to patreon.com slash astrologypodcast. And you can see some of the different benefits you can get by becoming a patron and supporting the work that I'm doing here on the podcast. Um, I think I'm also launching a rectification course with Patrick Watson sometime in November and an intro to astrology course sometime in November as well, probably later in the month. So keep an eye out for that, and I'll have more information available soon. All right. Thank you both for joining me today, and thanks to our audience. We had like a lot of people join us of patrons joining us for the live episode and, and adding stuff to the conversation, which has been really fun and helpful. So thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you, Lisa and Austin, for doing this episode with me. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, good luck in November. That's it for this episode of the podcast. So thanks everyone for listening or watching, and we'll see you again next time. Special thanks to all the patrons that supported the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, thanks to the patrons on our producers tier, including Nate Craddock, Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Sumo Kopic, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Morgan McKinsey, Kristen Otero, and Sanjay Srihari. If you like the work that I'm doing here on the podcast and you would like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through my page on patreon.com. And in exchange, you'll get access to bonus content, such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the month ahead forecast each month, access to a private monthly auspicious elections report that we put out each month, 
access to exclusive episodes that are only available for patrons, or you can also get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, go to patreon.com slash astrologypodcast. The main software we use here on the podcast to look at astrological charts is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available at alabe.com, and you can use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we use a similar set of software by the same programming team called AstroGold for Mac OS, which is available from astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount on that as well. If you would like to learn more about the approach to astrology that I outline on the podcast, then you should check out my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune, where I traced the origins of Western astrology and reconstructed the original system that was developed about 2,000 years ago. And in this book, I outline basic concepts, but also take you into intermediate and advanced techniques for reading a birth chart, including some timing techniques. So you can find out more about the book at hellenisticastrology.com slash book. The book pairs very well with my online course on ancient astrology called the Hellenistic Astrology Course, which has over 100 hours of video lectures where I go into detail about teaching you how to read a birth chart and showing hundreds of example charts in order to really demonstrate how the techniques work in practice. So find out more information about that at theastrologyschool.com. And finally, special thanks to our sponsors, including The Mountain Astrologer Magazine, which is available at mountainastrologer.com, The Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, available at honeycomb.co, The Portland School of Astrology at portlandastrology.org, and the AstroGold Astrology app, which is available for iPhone and Android. You can find out more information about that at astrogold.io.